There is a great debate in the literature, as you know, between mitral valve repair versus mitral valve replacement. What is your view on this? Well, that, Holly, that's a great question, and, uh, and it's, it's a good question because even 10 years ago, 90% of the valves, uh, valvular surgery done in this country was primarily mitral valve replacement. Several large institutions, though, did studies, particularly in the area of mitral regurgitation, and demonstrated that patients did better long-term um, with mitral valve repairs, and long-term meaning at 10 and 20 years after surgery. And the pendulum has swung now nationally, particularly in academic medical centers, toward mitral valve repair. Well, patients clearly come in, and if, uh, if they're, want to, they're going to want to get their valve repaired rather than the replaced, it sounds nicer, it sounds easier. How do you decide which patient gets what? Every t institution has a little, uh, really different criteria about this. There's several big institutions in this country that you know about that probably feel every patient should have a mitral valve repair. Uh, we're not one of those institutions. We found that even though every patient that comes through the door, we think about mitral re repair first, we'll say that, to give you two examples, patients with, uh, with uh, rheumatic heart disease probably do better with mitral valve replacements. Patients with very poor ventricular functions, particularly after acute heart attack, really don't do any better if you repair them and it may actually increase their operative risk. So those are two categories of patients that we would sort of push perhaps toward mitral valve replacement as opposed to repair. Okay. But well, again, every patient, we sort of think about mitral repair. Tell us then, how many patients coming in who get mitral valve surgery get a repair? I wouldn't know this, Holly, if I didn't just look it up, but last year in 2008, 75% uh, of the patients that came in for mitral valve surgery had mitral valve repairs at our institution. And uh, our operative mortality last year was zero. We had no deaths in that group. Over the last three years, our mortality is routinely between about 1% and 2% with all of mitral valve surgeries. Actually, over the last three years, it averaged 1.3%. So this is relatively safe surgery. Most of these patients do well. Many of these patients are young, although I did note that 10% of the patients were over the age of 80. Excellent. How often, when you're in the operating room, do you have to abort an attempt at repair and replace the valve? Not very often. I think the technology that we have now with transesophageal echoes and with the catheterization, uh, with careful histories taken by the referring cardiologist, I would say 99% of the time we're able to complete the operation that we go in and intending to do. It definitely increases operative risk if you try to do a procedure, can't do it, and then have to abort that procedure and go back and do a, a replacement. Again, mitral valve replacement is a very good operation. We've been doing it for 30 years at low operative risk. As a clinical cardiologist and following several people with severe mitral regurgitation, I know that people with severe mitral regurgitation who are asymptomatic can do well for a long period of time. I also know that these surgical techniques are getting better and, people, and mortality rates are getting lower. So how do, you, how do we decide when you take an asymptomatic patient to surgery? You know, that, that's the $60 million question right. and, and it's a question being asked at all medical centers across the country. How do you take a patient, particularly a young patient that feels good, that can do anything they want, who has mitral regurgitation and then subject them to an operation that could be potentially fatal? Our feeling that if a patient has uh, normal ventricular function, uh, essentially a normal heart, and has severe mitral regurgitation, you can follow that patient. And as I know you know, you can follow patients like that for five time. years or even 10 years before they really need surgery. On the other hand, if we see hearts start to enlarge, if left ventricular diastolic dimensions are enlarged, if the left atrium is enlarged, if they Increased are in atrial fibrillation, pressures. if the pulmonary pressures are being elevated, uh, then we consider those patients for surgery, even if they're asymptomatic. Tell me then, give me an example of an asymptomatic patient that you've operated on and why. Okay. The, uh, um, I'm thinking particularly of a gentleman that we operated on, on recently who is um, uh, a marathoner, talking about asymptomatic patients. In the last year's New York City Marathon, he ran a sub four hour marathon, which is a terrific time. Wow. You know, less than one tenth of one 
percent of the population could even approach that that kind of endurance. So how did you but take he, that guy to surgery? You know, he, he had four plus mitral regurgitation. He was followed by one of our cardiologists that has been following him carefully over the years and has been reluctant to send him to surgery. But on his last echo, which was done several months ago, he noted that the left ventricle, which is dilate, was gradually beginning to dilate, had gotten quite large. His atrium was enlarged. His PA pressure was slightly for the first time was coming up. He had a normal stress test, but, uh, and the guy, and the patient was, uh, was completely asymptomatic, was running 30 to 60 miles a week. Uh, but we decided that we should offer him surgery as an option. We went through the advantages and disadvantages of the surgery, all therapeutic options with him, and we really brought him into the decision-making process. It was myself, the cardiologist, and the patient, and he decided that he wanted to proceed with, with the surgery. Um, we went ahead and uh, did the operation. I have some pictures here that, that I can show you. The first picture shows uh, a new device that we have in the operating room. It's a three-dimensional echo, and you can actually see his heart beating, and this is a picture of his mitral valve. And you can see, Holly, this is a Barlow's type valve with redundant thickened leaflets. And you can't see the mitral regurgitation, but you can see that this is a, a pathological valve. The second picture um, that you'll see is, is the valve after it's repaired. You can see a ring that's in place, and you can see that the orifice or the opening size is smaller than before. The third picture is a picture of the native valve. This is a picture of the, of the heart itself. Uh, taken with uh, a regular camera, you can see uh, again the thickened leaflets. Uh, the valve is the heart has been arrested. The heart's been stopped. You're looking inside the left atrium, and you can see the valve itself. This uh, the subsequent picture. You can see the ring that is being placed around this valve. This is a supporting structure to, to prevent this la this valve from leaking in the future. And the last picture here, you can see the rings tied into position. This is just before we close up the heart, then we take the air out from inside the heart. We'll allow the heart to start beating again. Uh, this patient, um, one day after surgery, was out of bed. Two days out, out of, after surgery, was walking around. Four days, I almost had to tie him in to keep him from going home. We let him go home on the fifth day. He came back to my office uh, two weeks after surgery and was already walking two to three miles a day. Um, I, I think I'm going to have to hobble him to keep him from going back to running for at least another month. That's but great. the patient did very well. I'm expecting that this fall he's going to run a three and a half hour marathon. Yeah, he was asymptomatic compared to the rest of us, but for him he right. was probably not at his peak. That's right. So we'll get his time. Right. One last thing. Tell us about your choices in incisions. Clearly, okay. we're doing a lot more minimally invasive procedures than they're being done across the country. What's your perspective? We use two basic incisions for mitral valve surgery. The standard sternotomy is an incision that uh, is over the sternum. It used to be a very long incision, 12 inches long. We, now it's about a six inch incision, sometimes smaller than that. It allows excellent exposure to the heart, excellent exposure to the mitral valve. This is the, the incision that we use on the majority of the cases and is the standard incision used across the country. And was that the incision used on him? We used, he elected to have this incision. We offered both incisions, but he liked this incision. So you could see everything. There was, he, he was up two days later. Right, he was up two days later, had almost no pain after the surgery, didn't take almost any pain medication. Um, had a very benign, benign post-operative course. In this incision, we don't crack any ribs. It's a relatively atraumatic incision. The other incision is an incision that we use in reoperations, and particularly on young females that don't want to have a midline incision. We can make an incision beneath the right breast, and we go through the thoracic space. It's a little bit smaller incision, sometimes associated with, though, with more pain. Doesn't give us quite such good exposure to the heart, but it's adequate for this kind of surgery. And is that what you would choose on a, a more frail elderly patient, perhaps? Well, my, perhaps on a, on a more frail elderly patient, but particularly on someone where, cos, where the cosmetic result is, is, is crucial.